Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh out in the woods doing my favorite thing, which is looking at mushrooms. Uh, it's early June in North Carolina, and I am looking at some really beautiful uh, golden-ish chanterelle mushrooms and a variety of other things. But uh, the purpose of this video is to talk about chanterelles and chanterelle habitat. I'm also going to, before I get, get very far at all, uh, share a specimen of one of my favorite edible mushrooms this is a beautiful specimen of uh, a hedgehog mushroom, uh, Hydnum subgenus alba, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, I've been doing this channel for a while and I've covered how to identify chanterelles as a sort of general and large species group. So I'm not going to spend much time on that, but um, if you're a beginner, chanterelles are a really great uh, sort of group of species to focus on. They grow with hardwood trees, they come back year after year, their look-alikes are uh, not numerous and not particularly close looking to chanterelles. But uh, in North Carolina and in the Piedmont, we have um, several dif different species, and they're very difficult to tell apart, sort of uh, morphologically speaking. And when I say morphologically, I mean like, what do they look like? What can you see with your eyeballs, not a microscope and not with uh, DNA analysis? And so at the risk of sounding pedantic, which I have observed any time I say the words, at the risk of sounding pedantic, what follows is often pedantic. I am going to talk about uh, the species that I think this particular collection is, uh, and that is Cantharellus velutinus. Now there is a possibility it is Cantharellus um, deceptivus, or Cantharellus phasmatus, uh, and so that's the deceptive chanterelle and the ghost chanterelle respectively, um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. And so again, you know, if you are um, just becoming familiar with chanterelles, these are actually a really good example of what you will be looking for, and I'm also going to cover some of the important plants to look for when you're in search of chanterelles. But uh, from an edibility perspective, you know, they're delightful, they're abundant, some some of them, uh, and you know, some of this collection, uh, but not all of it, some of them are uh, sort of fragrant and fruity. Um, and so, you know, that can convey uh, very pleasing flavors. Um, you know, before I get too far into sort of the um, uh, waxing, not philosophical, but talking a little bit about the different types of uh, chanterelles that we have in North Carolina, I will note that one of my favorite things to do with these is to make a uh, mushroom bacon. And so what you do is you uh, parboil up the mushrooms for a minute or two, and then you put uh, smoked paprika and a little bit of maple on them and lots of salt and maybe a little MSG powder if you're like me and then you just roast them at 350 for about 40 minutes or so until they're nice little crispy mushroom bits and um, you know chanterelles can be really nice for that because uh, you know the, once you parboil them they kind of stay consistent and stick together one of the things with cooking chanterelles is you have these false gills or sort of wrinkles and they can come apart in the pan if you are handling them too much and so you know putting them in an oven or or boiling them and then putting them in an oven makes my life very easy and they are less inclined to fall apart. But also that um, oftentimes that like, you know, fruity flavor goes really well with sort of the maple and the smokiness of a smoked paprika. So mushroom bacon, very tasty. That's what's going on my pizza tonight. But let's talk about uh, the different chanterelles and why I think this is in particular Cantharellus velutinus. Okay, so what you have with chanterelle mushrooms, and these are really uh, a great example of what I see in this patch. And this is a mushroom patch that's very abundant in numerous uh, chanterelle species. So with um, the Cantharellus genus, you have, I don't know, it's it's in excess of 25 species, I think, and probably far more than that. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, enough to keep you busy for a very long time, especially if you, um, you know, travel globally or visit the Western United States, you have a totally different cast of characters. But this particular uh, chanterelle patch sort of starts off in late May or early June with these mushrooms that are sort of golden to almost a uh, like orangey pinky color. And you can see it a little bit actually. Let me see if there's a specimen that is a little pinkier that I have. Hold on a second. Let me dig in the, dig in the pile here. Oh, looks like I might get a little rain. That's exciting. All right. 
Let's see here. All right, I'm rummaging around in some of the mushrooms I found. So this is a decent example. So it's a golden color and it has uh, like all chanterelles, um, false gills, which are sort of uh, wrinkly and forked. They're not deep and blade-like, so you can scrape them off very easily. But in the case of, of these specimens, and again, it may just be the, the sunlight, but they, oh, maybe here, this will show the pinkiness. Uh, so you have sort of this like almost pinky peachy blush to it. And there are two um, chanterelle species in North Carolina that are described as sort of being peachy in color. One is Cantharellus vel velutinus, and then the second is Cantharellus persicinus, which means peachy. So the peachy chanterelle, Cantharellus persicinus, there's a lot of uh, observations of it from up in the Appalachians. But I also have found that mushroom um, in this particular patch, but later in the year. So, you know, say September, early October, and it also is a much smaller um, mushroom overall. So these are pretty, like, I would say they will get a little bit bigger. Um, it, it isn't super wet, so they won't blow up super huge, but Cantharellus persicinus is really quite dainty, and they're, they're about the size of, like, um, the larger ones that I found are about the size of a 50 cent piece on their cap, and they also have these very slender stems, and they're very, very pink. Uh, by way of contrast, you know, these sort of mushrooms are way more like golden in color but as you start to look at them really closely and and in not um you know iphone light but actually the light that i'm using with my eyeballs you can see these blushes and flushes of a sort of pinky color Another thing that I've noted about these mushrooms in particular, and um, I don't think these are features for Cantharellus velutinus, but um, just in case you are a chanterelle nerd and you're watching this, um, the other features that I notice about these mushrooms, firstly, is that a lot of them are really quite dry by way of comparison with other chanterelles. So a great identification feature for most uh, chanterelle species and many of them are sort of a golden color, oftentimes much darker golden than this. Uh, but a great ID feature for them is, where's my mushroom knife? Oh my God. I mean, I started making a video and what are the tools that I need? There it is. <laughs> I don't need a lot of stuff. This, this is another, I'm, I'm gonna talk about actually before I start splitting this apart and talking about Cantharellus velutinus and Cantharellus phasmatus and deceptivus. Um, I want to explain that one of the reasons I love mushroom hunting so very much is it really does not require a lot of preparation, equipment, or maintenance. Uh, so, you know, for instance, people I know who are into other outdoorsy activities, oftentimes they have to keep bicycles in really good working order, or they have a lot of camping equipment. For me, um, you know, if you're a beginner, these are my recommendations for what you need to go mushroom hunting. You need a bottle of water. You need a working, um, you know, smartphone with people who know exactly where you are. Um, I'm in a park that's like right next to all kinds of humans, so I'm not concerned about getting lost. But you know, if you're gonna go like into the wilderness, all of the rules about wilderness survival apply here. But I'm talking about sort of the mundane day-to-day -day weekend mushroom hunting that you do, you know, at your local not state park, but well-trafficked park. State parks are illegal for mushroom gathering in North Carolina and most other places, so be careful. They do give tickets and they are watching. Uh, but you know, if you're, if you're like me and you're just chilling out in the woods for a morning, you need your bottle of water, you need um, a knife, and I do like my mushroom knives. This is a really cheap one that I got off of Amazon. It has a nice little um, curved blade that makes it really easy to dig and pop mushrooms up from the base, which is really helpful for identification. And it also has this handy dandy uh, brush on the end, which especially with chanterelles, this is like beginner stuff. Actually, I'll do this with one of my hedgehogs because it's another great example of a mushroom that you really want to brush for. So this is a great edible um, <clears throat> mushroom. Hedgehogs are delightful, but uh, they have these little teeth on the underside and those teeth can just get full of duff and stuff. And so you want to brush it off. And you, this one's actually kind of old mushroom. Now that I look at it, it's, it's bug eaten and the uh, teeth are coming off. So as a way to test whether or not actually your mushroom is good to take home with you. Uh, but you really 
really want to clean up these little wrinkles and teeth and things like that because if you don't uh it they get really sticky and once you start to get condensation and they start to dry out it just becomes this like slimy pseudo muddy mess on the top so brushes are really good um i use a mushroom brush but i also carry a paintbrush with me uh you know in case i misplace my mushroom knife which happens regularly um, I, of course, like to bring a backpack so that I have my um, tripod in it and, you know, any snacks that I want. I like a walking or poking stick. Uh, this one is something I, I did not purchase. I uh, always thought that it was kind of ludicrous for, uh, you know, a human to purchase a walking stick. But then someone gifted me this and the uh, hooked, uh, you know, handle is really good for flipping mushrooms over without having to approach them too closely. And, uh, you know, that's awfully great, especially if they're in the undergrowth and I really don't know whether or not I want to inspect them. So, uh, you know, stick, water, knife, uh, you want to be sure that you don't get eaten up by bugs, you know, especially um, illness bearing bugs. So, you know, you want to be conscious of ticks and lime also, the Lone Star Ticks have this weird uh, thing that they have called Alpha Gal. So if they bite you, you can become allergic to red meat. So that's pretty awful. So I treat my clothing with uh, Promethin and that lasts, you know, several washes and that will keep bugs at bay. So, but you do want to do that. You also avoiding, you know, mosquito bites, not only from a, a you know, enjoying life perspective, but also you want to be mindful of West Nile and all those awful things. So make sure that you protect yourself from um, the local wildlife and don't tread on it and keep your eyes about you. And really that's all you need. And so, you know, it's not terribly difficult for me to have, um, you know, my mushroom pack in my car at any given time. And if I see something interesting, then I can go and investigate it with all the tools at my disposal. Oh, and I forgot also a hand lens is really fun. Uh, mine is buried deep in the bag, but you know, if you want to look at things very closely, a little jeweler's loop that costs like six bucks is, um, really a fun way to sort of augment, uh, observing mushrooms in the wild and hunting for them. So anyway, um, I also want to, if you're new to the channel or you don't know me or, or you care, uh, I consider myself to be a mushroom botherer or a mushroom hunter, but not a mycologist. And so what I mean by that is that I love to gather mushrooms in the wild. I have several resources at home, you know, some books that I really enjoy. There are some authoritative apps and websites like iNaturalist and Mushroom Expert and Mushroom Observer that I rely on to sort of observe mushrooms at a really sort of casual level. And so when it comes to, for instance, saying if this is Cantharellus velutinus, I will not be able to tell you because I won't be doing genetic analysis. Shoot, I won't even be doing microscopy. Like I have a microscope at my house, but I use it uh, not as often as I could. And that's because, again, I'm a mushroom hunter. I'm out to see these organisms and interact with them. And just the sheer delight of coming across mushrooms is really um, what gives me a lot of that sort of thrill that, that is, you know, an important and potent part of why a mushroom obsession has become a part of my life. Uh, and I also really fancy the term mushroom botherer, um, that somebody, I can't remember who, but someone in our, you know, widely distributed nerd community came up with the term mushroom botherer, which I love because I'm not always foraging for food. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm going to take some chanterelles home. I'm going to have a pizza, but for the most part, you know, I gather the mushrooms I want to eat. And then I spend the lion's share of my time really trying to find other things and take pictures of them. And so at a certain point, I um, have mushrooms that I really like to gather and eat, chanterelles and hedgehogs and lion's mane and hen of the woods. And, you know, there's a, there's a not insignificant list of really tasty mushrooms out there. But once I'm good on the like, I can fill my belly with a few, uh, you know, wild edibles, then I switch over into mushroom bothering mode where I'm poking them with sticks and I'm looking at things that I've never seen before. And I'm, oh, <laughs> another thing I actually, I was gonna tell you that you should bring along with you is waxed paper. This is so helpful if you're interested in identifying mushrooms at home. So, um, you know, it, it 
can seem like a pain in the butt. I know so many people who are really avid mushroom hunters who have never like truly gotten over the take the wax paper every time hump and I got there last summer and I'm like why did I live like that before because I always I'm like I'm just not gonna gather that many or I'll take pictures and that'll be adequate for my identification work at home and then I get out in the field and I'm like these things are so cool and I've interacted with them and I've grabbed them and mashed them up anyway so I may as well take them home and really being able to look at a mushroom in person when you're looking at your books and other ID resources Sources is fun and you can see if it changes colors over time so anyway waxed paper very important and very fun and I will show you why here's one of my chanterelles this one actually is a really good example of one that got bit off and I just like found this chomped half so uh, another thing to note like mushrooms are food for wildlife and so you will find a lot of munched on and eaten things that you may not necessarily bring home but anyway i got my mushroom here and i got my wax paper here and i plop it right down in the middle and then i make a little sort of like old school taffy candy wrapper around it so i wrap it you know into a tube and then wrap the ends and at that point, you have a nicely nested little mushroom in here. And you would think that if you throw that into the other thing that you're gonna need, which is a basket or bag that has a nice uh, uh, flat bottom, you'd think that that would start to get jumbled up and you'd need an additional thing to organize your stuff and keep the structure. But the reality is that most mushrooms are light enough that once they're wrapped up in their um, little wax paper you know, tube, then they will not sustain a lot of damage. And that includes some mushrooms that are very, very fragile. So big fan of the wax paper. So I really do think I've covered all the stuff that you should bring mushroom hunting with you. So let's talk about Cantharellus velutinus. Um, I wanted to show you this uh, particular, well, so, th so these are the things that I note about this particular group of chanterelles that I'm seeing in the early season that I'm uh, you know, have numerous folks have said that they agree with me that they think it's Cantharellus velutinus. That doesn't, again, like I can't truly verify this because I'm lazy and I have a job and I don't do DNA analysis in my living room, which maybe I should. Um, but uh, one of the things that I note about these is I find them in the early summer and they range uh, from this sort of light golden color to a really uh, very, very pale sort of uh, you know, orange. And, and again, the, the pinky color isn't showing up terribly well, but it is there. So, uh, you know, especially on the false, uh, gill surface, I'm going to just decapitate this sucker here. All right. So if you look closely, you'll see it is orangey, but it also is more like almost, um, you know, not salmon. Cause that's more of a pink color, but it's like, Salmon, if salmon ate way, way too many carrot carrots and you had a beta carotene incident. So, um, you know, you have these sort of light colored mushrooms and also very light colored uh, whitish and, um, as I started to mention, pretty dry flesh. So as you start to collect different chanterelles, you'll notice some of them are really, uh, you know, very uh, thick and consistent like string cheese on the inside. This particular species, whatever it is, Velutinus, I hope, um, definitely has that feature. And also it is so dry that I often see little, um, you know, like splits in the mushroom itself. So it's starting to almost like self peel itself. And then additionally, this one has a little bit of maggot damage, but um, many times these chanterelles are less bug ridden and overall just like less wet than, uh, you know, other chanterelles that are a darker golden color that I sort of start to find in a couple of weeks time. I didn't come across any today, unfortunately. So um, in addition to that, you have a really nice sort of in uh, like flowery cap. These mushrooms, as I mentioned, are a little bit on the young side, but they don't get like, I've been gathering this, uh, whatever this is <laughs> for like, eight years in this spot 
and uh, you know, some years the mushrooms will get larger, like about yay, but oftentimes this is about as large as they get. And, and this whole patch is covered in baby mushrooms, and many of them are baby mushrooms that came up a few days ago and have been eaten by bugs, and they're not going to reach their, their full stature. So it does seem to depend a good bit, um, you know, uh, temperature and weather, you know, temperature and uh, humidity wise, uh, how big they end up getting. Oh, and look at this. This is another example of like your primary, uh, well, no, you have a couple of different competitors for your mushrooms. So right here we have a, a, a slug. So I uh, found a couple of mushrooms. I put them here and then I went and visited other parts of the patch and I came back and this dude was just like nomming on my, my threesome here. Uh, another thing, like the, these mushrooms do form in twins and triplets and sometimes I've even seen four of them. But I came back and he was, he was um, cruising along the cap here and he is now uh, moved on to another spot. And I'm just really, I'm giving him the, uh, the, you know, I guess gastropod equivalent of the county fair ride, just swirling him around here. Uh, but you know, you will oftentimes find little, um, sort of soapy slug trails on, uh, your mushrooms. And also you'll find a lot of bug damage. Um, so let me see. Here's a good example. Okay, so when I'm harvesting chanterelles, oftentimes I don't even pick them. If I squeeze, uh, <laughs> I'm doing this out of view. So I've got a little one right here, and this is a perfect example of the babies I was talking about. I'm squeezing the base right here, and it's completely hollow on the inside. So I was talking about how they're like string cheese. That is true, unless they have been visited by uh, fly maggots, and that uh, bug damage happens very, very quickly. A lot of people are like, oh, it's just more protein. I'm like, yeah, just more protein, yes, but like up to a certain point, and that is definitely way past that point. Like, it's not that I'm concerned about it, but one thing that happens when you have a lot of bug damage in a mushroom also is they become very inconsistent and mealy. And I was talking about how I do a little parboil of these mushrooms before I cook them, and if they're mealy, they're much more likely to turn into this just like weird bubble, bubble, toil and trouble kind of pile of, of orangey water. Um, speaking of the orange, so, you know, these mushrooms are really um, kind of like buff or pale uh, compared to a lot of golden chanterelles. Like if you find golden chanterelles in the Pacific Northwest, they are really, really orangey. And these are almost, um, they almost are like a powdery orange. And so it's, um, you know, definitely not that rich egg yolk color that some uh, different, you know, articles about chanterelles will refer to. And then additionally, these mushrooms have um, a lot of sort of orange staining that happens as you damage them and as time goes on. And sometimes um, when you find them, you'll actually see a lot of orange has, oh, here's actually a really good example. Uh, so I picked this one maybe about 40 minutes ago. And as you can see, it's got this like orangey carroty color that's coming in. And I don't know why that is. I want to do some more research because it, you know, it's one of those that I've Googled and been like, oh, that looks like it might be more chemistry paper extract uh, <laughs> abstracts than I'm able to look at for one day. But they do have this orangey staining reaction. And uh, so that really covers it um, when it comes to those other species I was talking about. So Cantharellus velutinus, I don't know if it has a common name, which is, of course is, that's another thing. If you're new to mushroom hunting and you go onto forums, people are gonna start dropping scientific names almost immediately. And some people, I hate to say it, some people are really snotty about scientific names, which I don't agree with. I don't think you should be snotty about somebody not having very good grasp of why the scientific names end up being so uh, critical in mycology. So a lot of the other sort of hobbyist natural sciences, so birding, looking at mammals and things like that, you don't have to really mess around with scientific names because you don't have all that many species to discuss. So you can have common names for everything. Or in the case of birds, honestly, there's a lot more birders out there. So there is a general agreement among many people to standardize on a common name. Mushroom hunting in North America is fundamentally different. First of all, you know, I have um, 
No idea if this is Cantharellus velutinus, Cantharellus phasmatus, which is a really lovely pale golden uh, chanterelle, uh, the ghost chanterelle, which I think is the best common name of maybe all time. I'll talk about the other best common name in a second when we discuss my hedgehog, but um, you know, I can't tell you for sure if it's that or the deceptive chanterelle, again, you know, sort of a pale golden chanterelle, uh, Cantharellus deceptivus. Um, but, you know, if I were out here and I hear a pine warbler, I'm not going to have to say to somebody, well, it is a pine warbler and then spit out the scientific name. But because there is so few people into mycology and also so much radical and rapid change with genetic analysis and discovery of new species, that scientific names become very important. <laughs> uh, first, because there ain't no common name. Secondly, there are very significant regional differences in common names that people use. And so you don't have nearly as much standardization as you would on, say, birds. Um, and, but really, you know, the main thing is that, like, for instance, with bears, what, there's like seven species of bears in the world. You can just go ahead and name them by color and everybody, bear expert to the, you know, youngest child, will be able to get down with uh, bears and get their head around it. But, you know, I'm talking about a genus that is a, probably a small genus by way of comparison. Chanterelles, you know, I'm all, like only looking at 20 line items on, um, you know, a, a quick rundown of things that Google indexes as chanterelle entities. And so, you know, the scientific names culturally have a lot of currency uh, because people who keep up with the science do invest a lot of time and energy into ensuring that they are revising their knowledge constantly. And so if you're new and you get onto forums and people start throwing around uh, a lot of burly scientific names, that's why. And it, you know, it isn't necessarily condescension. Now, granted, there is a lot of difficulty in, um, I mean, not difficulty, but it's challenging to acquire this knowledge because the knowledge isn't easy to get to and find. You, you know, have to be willing to look at scientific papers. You have to be willing to find a way to get access to those papers. And you also have to uh, communicate with a lot of highly distributed experts with a lot of very specific regional knowledge. And so, you know, again, you just have um, a culture that uses scientific names a lot more than any other place that I've kind of run across in my time. Um, I am fortunate enough that I studied Roman history in college, but did not have Latin. So I'm like, oh, it's a word that I don't understand and it's long and you know it 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 sounds it sounds like a Roman general I'm comfortable with it so when I fell into mycology I'm like okay the scientific names are helpful for forming big categories and understanding sort of who is related to who and so that is a decision that I made you know fairly early on that common names although there are many of them and they can be very useful the level of specificity is helpful with scientific names but more for me it is a categorization exercise so for example we have our uh you know two mushrooms that I'm talking about here our our chanterelles and also our uh, hiddenum mushroom, uh, also known as hedgehog mushroom. And both of these are in the same order of the fungal kingdom. So these are the, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, cantharellares. See? I mean, and, and it's kind of immaterial, honestly. Like, I'm not going to talk to many people face to face about how to pronounce the order name. But these two mushrooms are, even though, you know, morphologically, they, one of them has teeth and one of them has wrinkles, there's a lot of actual physical similarities between them, lumpiness and bumpiness, but more to the point, they are genetically related in the same order, which occurs above family and genus and species. And so understanding mushrooms at that genetic level or that sort of hyper-categorization can be really handy for retention. Um, also, I just like hierarchy and labels like I do that for a job and so this is one of those areas that um, you know it tickles certain uh, certain of my neurons are turned on by complicated categorization using scientific or using Latin and Greek and stuff like that 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent so much time learning about the Peloponnesian War and so much time obsessing about whether or not this is Cantharellus velutinus. All right, so I am going to finish because I have talked for nearly 30 minutes. But as you can tell, I'm really pumped about mushroom season. I also, um, oh, I was going to share a couple of native plants with you, so I'll do that in a second. But let's talk about um, my hedgehog real quick. I've covered identification features in another video. This is Hiddenum subgenus alba. So in the eastern U.S., we have 16 or 17 different species of hedgehog mushrooms. And again, this is one of those, like, I love hedgehogs. They're my favorite edible. And when I find them, I am identifying them only to genus because I can't get to species without, I can't get to species without more sciencing than I have time for. Uh, that said, you know, they're these beautiful sort of, um, you know, uh, lumpy and bumpy and you know they grow in the same habitats as chanterelles and so I often find them in onesies twosies uh, but they sometimes because they're almost flowery on the top sometimes they look like a bleached out chanterelle from the top and then you look on the underside and you have these adorable little teeth little dentines you can also see and this is one of those things is like in the can I'm gonna try it again cantharellales Ooh, I'm getting closer I think okay so maybe I should have practiced before before I did this video, but uh, Cantharell, Cantharell Lollies. I'm gonna spend some time with that this afternoon. Oh gosh, the learning opportunities are endless. Is it gonna be pronunciation or identification? Or am I gonna just decide to eat them and put them on a pizza? Who knows, maybe all, maybe none. Um, but as you can see, it also has this orange staining reaction. And, um, you know, so genetically speaking, there are similarities and you also have these interesting sort of um, parallels or echoes of similar, of similar visible characteristics, morphological characteristics. Okie dokie. So I'm gonna talk about uh, habitat really fast. So if you are new to mushroom hunting, Habitat is absolutely critical. Um, you know, the mushrooms that you're oftentimes hunting for on the forest floor are mycorrhizal often, meaning that they are symbiotes. They grow with a plant or tree partner, which means they will grow year after year in the same spot. That's why people are secretive about their mushroom patches and also why learning what trees and plants to look for is critical. So I'm gonna start with one that I see in most of my mushroom patches and, and all over the North Carolina Piedmont. It's just one of my favorite plants. This is wild ginger. And it's a really easy plant to identify. It just comes up in a you know single stalk here. It's kind of a like a um, little bit green purple stalk situation. You have a heart shape leaf that has these beautiful dark and light green splotches and patterning and um, the aroma is uh, a little bit gingery and a little sweet like anise or black licorice the root itself uh, actually is quite spicy and so people will dig it up and you know use it uh, I think the the one time I actually had something that was made with wild ginger it was a wild ginger beer root beer type of beverage and it was really quite tasty so I don't do that I just love to take photographs of them and this uh, you know heart-shaped leaf with the multiple like I am a sucker for uh, gradients in um, in the green spectrum and so anything with these sort of uh, multicolored things always it's, it's just something that turns me on I love it all right, so I see a lot of wild ginger, uh, but one of the plants that is just ubiquitous is, um, oh, is um, muscadine. And so muscadine is uh, basically a wild uh, grape uh, vine. And so I find this growing on the forest floor pretty much in all of my chanterelle patches. And uh, oftentimes it seems to also displace the poison ivy a little bit because it runs all over the same spots that the poison ivy would take over and uh, maybe even keeps the kudzu at bay. I don't know. All I know is that, you know, as far as ground cover is concerned, this uh, muscadine is really uh, super duper common. And even though it is a grape, I very rarely see it like actually bearing fruit uh, in the uh, mushroom habitats. I just see it as a, uh, you know, a, a vine running on the forest floor. So there's that. Another one, speaking of things that run on the forest floor, is another, also another thing that has those cool uh, variegation in sort of the green coloration. This is running cedar. So it's just this really soft, 
um, feathery little plant, but it has the, um, you know, different knuckles and segments and also sort of like forward pointing, um, sort of pointy bits that cedar does, but it isn't spiky. It's really, really soft. And they come up in these little plants and they're connected at the base. And so you'll find these huge patches of it that, uh, you know, run across the forest floor. And I oftentimes will find those um, sort of around the perimeter of my chanterelle patches. I usually don't find like a bunch of chanterelles or a bunch of golden chanterelles in running cedar. I oftentimes find um, the red chanterelles or the cinnabar red chanterelle, cantharellus, uh, cinnabarinus growing with running cedar. But this is one of the plants, like if I'm just cruising around looking at a new park and I see a patch of running cedar, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go in there and see if I find some muscadine and then I'll see if I find some chanterelles. And then I will see if I can find one or two hedgehogs for every 40 or 50 chanterelle mushrooms I find. Okay, so we have that we've talked about. Uh, now, most importantly also for chanterelles is oak. So uh, this is white oak um, leaves. Actually, I'll just get an individual leaf to, to talk to you about. Oh, here's a, better, here's a better example. So you have a couple of different kinds of oak, um, but this is a, a grove that is primarily white oak. And so what you have is a, a leaf with multiple lobes, usually three or four. Um, let's see, one, two, three. Yeah, so this one I would consider, well, three or four. I don't know anything about botany. Like everything I know about trees and plants honestly is pretty directly related to mushrooms in one way or another but um you know you have these lobed leaves and in the case of white oak they're nice and rounded and you'll see actually in the middle you know you have these these veins like one central vein and then veins that come out into the lobes but you'll see the ends of these uh like the terminal points of these lobes actually have like a little indentation so it's almost like the top of a little heart so that's your white oak let me see if i can find nearby oh good deal here's one so um the other sort of mega group of oaks to look out for are this isn't a very good example here's a better one oh yeah this is a far better one so I think this is uh, Spanish oak probably, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure. But red oak, uh, and there's a variety of species of white oaks, but also a variety of species of red oaks. But similarly, you have um, you know, a leaf that has these lobes, it's just in the case of red oak, they're not rounded, they're pointed. And very frequently you have like right at uh, the tip, almost little bristles. And, uh, you know, at the, at the top here, you have a little bit of flamey pointiness. This is a, like, if you paint it orange, it's a little bit on the, you know, hot rod uh, side of things. It's one of my favorite things also about uh, fall is all of the different oak leaves and colors that they turn. But oak is the quintessential uh, habitat for chanterelles. But they also produce a lot of other really spectacular mushrooms. And so anytime I see, you know, lobed pointies or lobed rounded and heart shaped, I'm like, yes, this is an area that I may find some mushrooms that will interest me. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to talk about our native holly. And so you'll see a lot of holly like everywhere and a lot of it is English holly. And that holly is, you know, if you're probably familiar with holly. It's very pointy. It's sort of a rounded leaf and um, they're smooth trees. They really, my biggest hang up with them is that I sit on holly leaves regularly, but I find all kinds of cool mushrooms right underneath holly trees all the time. Uh, but, you know, the um, native holly has a flattened leaf, uh, so it's very, very flat. If you find um, an invasive European holly or a transplanted European holly, that will be uh, sort of a curly leaf. And so that's sort of an overview of some of the native plants that I typically find and look for. Um, I guess in parting, I'm gonna give you one more shot of the mushroom patch here. That's another thing I do like to look out for, these little hillocks and spots that have moss. And oftentimes you'll get uh, a view of a couple good mushrooms and the moss makes for also a really lovely sort of tableau to take a photograph. And again, talking about my mushroom bothering habit, oftentimes I am most drawn to the mushrooms that are unusual or are, um, you know, I don't ask myself necessarily how they are useful to me. I ask myself 
how do I notice this thing being different from other things I've seen before? And that does the things in my brain that help me learn, help me enjoy my life a little bit more. Anyway, happy mushroom season. I hope you're doing great and find a billion mushrooms. We'll talk next time.